All right, so I know some folks are still filtering in, but uh, we're going to kick this thing off. Um, I think when everyone realizes uh, what they're missing out on, uh, they're going to rush back in here. Um, so to my left, uh, as my uh, colleague Jeff Kleinman announced over the, uh, the Voice of God microphone back there, uh, Mike and Lisa Hinckley from Green Flash Brewing here uh, locally in, in San Diego, um, they have a pretty interesting business right now. Um, you know, I, I asked Mike basically, what, two, three weeks ago uh, after you guys, well, maybe it was about a month ago now, after you guys acquired Alpine um, or made the announcement about Alpine to, to come and join us um, because there's just so much that you guys are doing uh, that's curious to not only me, but I assume other people in the room. Um, you pushed very quickly into 50 states. Uh, you made this acquisition announcement. You're building a brewery in Virginia Beach. So um, I want to figure out why you're doing all this and uh, <laughs> how you're doing it so quickly. Um, so let's kind of start with the distribution piece. Um, why did you guys make an effort to expand so rapidly into, into so many states all at once? Um, it, it, was, it was our plan. Um, we wanted to go. Uh, we think the market's going to go toward a, uh, you know, whether this 50 million barrel mark or, or what people are talking about where the where the market can go. Um, we think it's just going to get more and more and more competitive, especially in the say six pack market. Um, you know, the more mainstream craft styles, and uh, we think we can be a national specialty brewer. Um, and we think the, the role of six packs is on a very much more regional or local level. Um, so we thought it best to uh, go down the national specialty market first uh, and then later roll out in more of a regional way. So, so. Um, so, that, that, so that was really the goal. And part, part of it being, uh, you know, why do we go to, say, Wyoming? Yeah. Um, or Nebraska. Or Nebraska or... <laughs> Um, where we sell very little beer, but we open those markets the same way we do New York City. Um, we do a lot of research. We go, we visit the retailers. Um, you know, we, even though we realize we're not going to sell a lot of beer there, um, it's, we consider it an investment in the future. So as this, uh, you, know, the, you know, the core beer geek customer already knows us and they like our beers and, um, you know, we're pretty popular in that set. But as, as uh, the customer moves from you know, the more, you know, loggers into... We lost your mic there, by the way. Oh. Oh. Let me hang it back on you. We're having issues with that one today. Okay. Mike. Mike. This is our quality control, I, I guess, that we There's need There's something to... wrong with my ear, probably. <laughs> <laughs> it's large. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, can, is that good? Can you hear yeah. me? No, you're good. It's good. Um, just as the customer moves the toward, here for you uh, too. Just, that'll probably be easier in case it falls off again. Just remember, keep it up. Okay. Uh, as the customer moves toward our, uh, you know, style of beer is more aggressive, more assertive, more flavorful, and out of, uh, you know, the kind of more easy drinking styles, and moves into the super specialties that we make. We want to be there for that transition in Wyoming, even though. You know, we don't make any money. We, we lose money there. We visit the distributors. We treat it just like New York City. So you're willing to take a hit just to get a spot on the shelf or just to start building your name? I mean, uh, Not a spot on the shelf. Um, uh, presence brand. in the customer's mind. Yeah, building the brand. Um, yeah, in, in Wyoming, when that person goes from drinking pale ale to IPA and then goes into... Uh, you know, really bitter beer or sours or Belgians. And, um, you know, we want to be part of, of their experience. And, um, you know, building the brand for us is just creating the Green Flash experience for our customers wherever they might be. Now, Lisa, you, you head up all the marketing initiatives. Yes. And it's, it's great that you're there if they decide to, to turn towards a Green Flash product. But, I mean, how are you communicating with them and convincing them to, to take that leap and, and try one of your beers? Well, our whole marketing like, strategy is about direct interaction with our customers. You know, so whatever, whatever market we're in, we want to have direct interaction with them through our sales reps, through having, sending Chuck and Dave, our beer ed guy, out to it, um, accounts to talk to them and um, tell them about the products. We have um, 
other events around, and we also do like lifestyle events around the country too to, to attract people from everywhere in these places into one place. You know, the pe ones that do that, certain lifestyle events, like a music, big music thing, or something like South by Southwest or something that brings people from a big area. And you can, if you're there, then you're hitting those people as well. So has that been a tough thing to manage having gone into all these states and trying to have all these conversations at once? Do you stagger them? I mean, uh, it seems like there, there'd be a lot of you know, work on the back end to make sure that everything is going smoothly. Yeah, they've been staggered. We haven't opened them all at once. We were open in several markets before, and then we started to open more. We had a chunk in the beginning, and then... And, you know, uh, our, our approach is um, we really don't spend a lot of money selling beer. Right. You know, um, we spend a lot of money building our brand. So, um, you know, Chuck, who's, uh, he's here, you know, uh, one of the best brewers in the whole country, by the way. Um, uh, he, he probably cannot count the cities he's flown to to have a beer dinner with 15 people, you know, where, um, and, and that's very important to us. And Dave Adams, who's our in-house um, master Cicerone candidate um, and just a, a great food and beer pairing guy, uh, same thing, probably 20 weeks a year on the road. Um, visiting, you know, small accounts with just the right people. Um, we dedicate a lot to that, and we, we really view that as our, you know, our future, our building a brand. So, so when I say selling money, building a brand, and not selling beer, um, and we're, we're probably small, you know, for what some people think, wow, you're in 50 states and you're 70,000 barrels of beer. Right. Um, we're 70,000 barrels of beer without the benefit of a six-pack. Um, we could probably be a, twice this if we did... 12 packs at $15, and um, we've decided to say, you know, uh, build our business on maintaining our margins and maybe not having the velocity. We spend very little time and money and effort on the chains. Um, you know, we, uh, we don't discount, we don't, we don't scam back, we, uh, we create value for the customer and they pay $10 for four bottles on the East Coast and 13 on the West Coast, or vice versa. <laughs> And, um, you know, that's really building a brand. There's a lot of brewers out there that are doing similar initiatives, maybe not at the uh, same kind of scale that you guys are, you know, all across the country, maybe just in their home market, maybe in a few states. Mm -hmm. um, the, the kinds of things, Lisa, that you were describing, you know, getting into the market, having that personal interaction, um, doing a beer dinner. What makes Green Flash's attempts to do those things different than any other craft brewery that might be exploring those same types of initiatives? We just focus on our own Green Flash experience, you know, what we want people to experience with our beers. Um, you know, that we just do all those things he just described with the idea of, you know, educating people about our beers. And we make great beer, too, so it helps when they get to, beer gets into their hands and then it's good stuff and they buy it again. Yeah, I think it starts with some, you know, uh, creating real interesting, exciting beers. Mm -hmm. And then when we say we have events, it's, you know, we, we're starting to spend, you know, actually very little time at a, say, beer festival type. Uh, it's more direct interaction where we get to talk to our customers and uh, get, let them get to know us. We have a, a pretty distinct company culture, I think. Um, we're not a hype machine from a marketing standpoint. Um, we like to talk to people directly and uh, experience the beer with them and try to, uh, you, you know, what, what the, you know, where, where craft beer can go. and. Uh, you know, we don't brew, brew any beers to style. Every one of them is an expression of uh, something that's uh, dear to us. And uh, so we try to communicate that directly to people. You mentioned education. Mm -hmm. Are consumers educated enough about beer right now? And, and what are you guys doing to make sure that they are? Well, there's a core group of beer enthusiasts, the beer geek population, if you will. And then there's the people that are coming into the market, coming out of the, the blue moons and into the bigger beers and things, and so it's trying to draw them into the, you know, that's, that's talking to them about the beers, that they're not educated. We have programs that we do. We do a behind the craft and a supper club and things, and those are run by our beer education guy, and they are going to take those out on mobily out into the marketplace as well, and that's one way, and we draw people in. They're all interested. It might just be about pairing beer with chocolate or, with, you know, we had a butcher one time come in and butcher a animal. <laughs> not, not kill it and butcher, but... Actually already. killing animals. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not that... This is, no. this is his yeah. is differentiation right here. That is right different, here. right? Yeah. How many of you have done that? Okay, no, no. No, I mean, they came in and did a butcher demonstration on how to butcher something that's already 
in that state, you know. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, so it's something like that, the interesting things, and, you know, that's just... And, and the consumers responding, uh, I guess not the craft beer geek consumer, but because we were talking earlier this week about how you kind of break it out into two distinct groups. Mm -hmm. I think you said uh, the, the beer geeks and then the mainstream explorers is what you called them, mm -hmm. folks that are just starting to It's like the bullseye and then well. the next level out, you know, like coming into the middle with the bullseye. And that's, the that's where the, the, we think, uh, you know, really the education piece comes in, mm -hmm. is people are curious and, and they want to uh, experience new things. And, um, you know, we want to be there for that, for the process. So one, one thing I see a lot when we do these events at our brewery is people like there's a lot of guys in the beer industry or in the beer world that like beer they bring their dates and when, that's the really cool part is they'll they'll come in and the women will say well i'm just a wine person i don't really do it. but by the end of the night they're like wow this is really cool because they've never experienced it that way they think of beer in a different way sometimes so that's one way that you bring in the people you know you bring in the the other half of a, and a that's beer a, couple that's at your brewery <laughs> yeah that's yeah. at our brewery and we do a so, supper club we do, where we, do we bring in a chef to our brewery every, uh, once a quarter um and hold our own beer dinner so how do, you take, how do you take what happens inside your own compound and as you move into all these states, recreate that experience in, in a new environment? I mean, what are some strategies for doing that? With good planning. I mean, you yeah. take your same program and, um, you know, the, the branding of the program and you put it out in the marketplace. And we have people out in the territories that promote the thing, help us promote it with our yeah. customers and our distributors. So we have 30 sales and marketing people around the country and we, um, you know, continually training them um, and supporting them in events. We have event staff at the brewery that uh, supports them in the, in the beer dinners that they can hold themselves mm -hmm. um, with input uh, from Chuck or from Dave. Um, so we try to take that to everywhere, that, everywhere we can, you know, that's, uh, and that's why we have 30 salespeople around the country. It's How much freedom are you giving them to go out and, and tackle and spearhead their own educational initiatives? Well, I think we, we set a, kind of a standard and a guideline, um, but we hire very creative and very uh, dedicated, very passionate people to begin with. And we give them tools, that yeah. we, uh, marketing tools that we provide for them to Absolutely. Them. And, and what are those tools Well, you know, like? just whatever the, the branded product stuff that we do, you know, right. the way to promote their, their events. Um, we also um, do these uh, like once a year or twice a year, depending on the, the, some of the bigger markets, we do like a, f we call it the flash mob, and we'll bring sales and marketing, the whole group. I mean, all this local salespeople, Jim, and then all the marketing people out to a territory, and we do um, like kind of blanket it with fun events, you know, and, and uh, I don't know, it's really fun. So we'll take 30 people into Chicago, yeah. mm -hmm. and we'll spend, or New York. Uh, you know, or maybe, maybe even more, spend the day in the trade with sales reps going around visiting accounts mm -hmm. just kind of like ride along that's pretty standard, mm -hmm. uh, and then have a series of events every night all around a city. Um, you know, we'll do, we've done that in Chicago, New York, and Austin, and San Francisco, I mean, many places. Um, and Mike and I Flash go Flash mob, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that cool? Yeah. <laughs> right. And Mike and I do it. You we guys go out dance too while you're there? Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. what happens? Choreograph that. That's part of the marketing plan, I yeah. think. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, I'm curious how Alpine fits into, you know, your, your big picture. Um, you know, where, where do they fit in this, uh, this approach of, you know, getting out to multiple markets, being there for the consumer when they try it and, you know, performing all these, uh, you know, guerrilla marketing t initiatives, if you right. will. So, uh, one of, one of the reasons that we have spread, uh, ourselves out the way we have is so, so for instance, we have a, a barrel age program that's about to kick off. We have, we're building a second packaging facility in San Diego for barrel aged beers and sours. And, uh, and maybe we have about a thousand bourbon and wine barrels in process and a uh, cork finished bottling line. And we'll be able to plug those things in, in these various markets at certain levels. Um, we'll be able to do the same sort of thing with Alpine. Um, but the Alpine thing really came about because, uh, well, we, agreed to, to make beer for them in when they, uh, they want, they have a terrific brand. You know, it's uh, very popular, um, the, the beers are amazing, um, but they've never really gathered the resources to build a real production facility. So um, they wanted to basically contract brew or handshake brew, we called it. We never actually wrote a contract, but um, we said, yeah, we'll make some beer for you and, um, you know, and help you toward that. And then uh, as, the, as the year went on, I'm doing that, um, they realized what a lot of people will realize and a lot of these new startups uh, realize is that 
Um, it takes a lot more to build a company than a great brand and some great beer and some money. There's a whole lot of uh, machine that has to work in the background. And um, basically, we've done that. You know? So um, we're able to really share resources. We have you know, human, uh, in addition to access to capital, mm -hmm. Um, you know, human resources, that, you know, an administrative staff, you know, uh, financial people, accounting people, people, HR, marketing, sales, <laughs> a distribution <laughs> channel. I mean, we have everything in place that they would have to put together over, say, the next 10 years if they wanted to build it. So do you see that area of the business uh, developing, you know, even you see more strategic partnerships and, and acquisition amongst craft brewers? And will you be part of that? I think it's inevitable that craft brewers will start to combine a little bit and share resources because the market gets more and more competitive, more and more challenging. Um, it's amazingly, it's very, very hard to build a company from scratch all the way. Um, you know, some of the people that are new into brewing and especially on the investment side, they don't get what a long play this is. Um, one thing that uh, Ken was up here and you had asked him about, could he envision it when and, and then how he's got to where he is. Um, the one part that he didn't mention that I'm sure is on his mind is 35 years. Um, this is, takes a long time. Um, that's a key part. You know, you really got to put together a whole business, you know, and, and uh, you know, like I said about as far as the margin versus the volume, if we grow at 15 to 20% a year and never have a margin hit, I would be very happy. You know, I see, I see breweries that are growing at 40% a year and you see them deep, deeply discounted in a retail chain and I, I wonder why. I mean, they, they, eventually they have to buy some more tanks and, and they're making that happen sooner without the cash. I, I don't know, I just, maybe there's something in there I just don't get, but um, you know, this is a, it's a pretty difficult thing people are trying to do. And Vir Virginia Beach, how does that all tie into your, your long play with, mm -hmm. with Green Flash? I mean, do you see uh, Green Flash having multiple facilities beyond, you know, the two that you'll have. Um, you, had, you had said that, you know, when San Diego gets to 100,000 barrels, then you'll open, open up the flow at, uh, at Virginia Beach and maybe some more down the road. Do you, is that, how many, where, where do you want to go? Do you want to have three? Do you want to have five? I, I don't, we don't, uh, you know, we don't have a number. Um, when Virginia Beach opens, that'll be a, a difficult transition because we'll be doubling our capacity in two facilities. Um, but we'll gain an awful lot. We'll be able to be, like, have our San Diego pricing on the East Coast. Um, you know, uh, freight savings, if it was today, is a million dollars a year, but um, really that's just going to get passed to the customer. Um, we'll be able to have a $9.99 four pack of West Coast in New York instead of $13.99 or $12.99. I mean, that's. Um, it's going to be a big jump in our business, we're, and we're very excited about it. And it'll also be another contact point. At least was talking about direct connections. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the whole East Coast travels through Virginia Beach between Memorial Day and Labor Day. And so we'll get great opportunity to touch base with those customers. And then when, uh, you know, the two breweries are at some point, if they are, uh, you know, outgrowing those, we'll go to the middle of the country, and we'll have another area that we can also be regional. So. Like I said, we've you know grown to this size without the benefit of a six pack or a 12 pack. Um, we're about to release six packs in San Diego this year uh, for 2015, uh, and then when Virginia Beach is open, we'll be able to do them there, uh, you know, on a certain regional basis. And if we were to put a brewery in the middle of the country, we could be not only that national specialty brand, but have some, you know, a single IPA and a pale ale and and some six pack type beer. Um, you know, within a certain uh, distance of the brewery. So, uh, you know, question for both of you in closing here. Um, you know, we, we always like to sort of ask folks when they, when they share their story how uh, some of our audience members might think about the same decisions that you guys have made. Um, you know, clearly those decisions for you have been, you know, a multi-facility uh, approach, um, you know, kind of getting out into all those markets pretty quickly and uh, balancing your portfolio in the way that you have, uh, you know, really focusing on, on the higher end, higher margin products. Um, probably won't be the approach that everyone takes, but, uh, you know, how should people be thinking about their own futures and 
whether or not they should go into all 50 states, right. whether or well, not they should it's, focus it's funny on the high you end. Ask because when you've asked me to come before, I haven't. And I actually, I kind of cringe when I tell people how many markets we're in. Um, I don't think it's a good idea for, you know, there's a lot of small breweries that are, you know, fairly small and in a bunch of territory and, uh, you know, shipping beer overseas. And I think it's a mistake for the most part. Um, and yet here you are. Yeah, I know. So that's why I say it kind of... <laughs> Um, but we made a very, uh, you know, it's a long, hard path to where we're going. Um, and we set up a plan that matches that. We're not trying to sell pale ale in uh, Italy in a six pack. You know what I mean? We're not, uh, we've, we've outlined some products that, that can travel some distance, still uh, are viable and still actually pay the bills. You know, so um, it's real tempting, I think, for young breweries to... Um, ship a container somewhere to bring in some cash, but I think they're in the long haul. They're hurting themselves over the long play, and you know, not that we didn't do it. Sometimes in the early years, you know, where you know you got to pay the rent, you know, and, and sometimes you make some bad decisions or or you make some hasty decisions to get some dollars in, and then um, you're and, stuck with them. <laughs> and then yeah, and then then you know you own those decisions. And uh, when I look back on any of those. I wish I wouldn't have made those decisions, those even things, though they brought in some now, cash. If I knew then what I know now, I would you know, do whatever, <laughs> you right. know, yeah. fill in the blank. So, um, you know, Reaper Ales, if anybody remembers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a couple people, right? <laughs> we heard the laughs. Yeah. Um, Lisa, it, you know, one final sort of comment from you. A, mm -hmm. As you know, people leave here from, uh, from here today and, and go think about uh, talking to consumers and um, mm -hmm. trying to get them more excited about either whether it's craft in general or their products. Mm -hmm. uh, any tips, any suggestions for, for the folks in the audience that you know, you're talking to these yeah. consumers directly all the time. So yeah, just talk to the consumers, find out what they you know, find out what they think of your beer before you make tons of it. You know, and 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 have a plan. You know, go in with a plan. Don't just freewheel it. Have a plan on, and a strategy for everything you do. It's a, you know, because it's, it's a business and you need to have a plan. It can go haywire if you just do it off the cuff. So mm -hmm. that would be my advice. Ask a lot of questions, too. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Try it out. Experiment. Like, work in a brewery and then have a brewery. Because then you understand it's a lot of work. So it's fun, but it's, it's a lot of work. It's a business. You know? mm. Awesome. Well, uh, we got two more conversations to finish up today. Mm -hmm. So All right. uh, we'll see you guys both back up here yeah. for the Brewers Roundtable.